Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. It's so nice to see so many people on this webinar, um, and happy Veterans Day to you as well. So this is a special webinar. We're celebrating not only Veterans Day, but the 2020 National Cybersecurity Awareness Week, which is led by NICE and NIST. Um, and we at CSU's Cleveland Marshall College of Laws Master of Legal Studies program in cybersecurity and data privacy are excited to talk to you about the state of cybersecurity jobs. And so before we dive in, I'd like to start with some introduction. So I'm going to move to the next slide here. Oh, um, well, I'm Julie DiBiasio. So who you hear talking is the Director of Graduate Studies and Professional Development here at Cleveland Marshall College of Law. Um, for the Master of Legal Studies program. Um, I'm happy to and willing and hopeful to speak to you about our Masters of Legal Studies program more in depth. So please, at any time, feel free to reach out to me. My contact information will be at the end of this presentation. But what I know you're all here for is to hear from Professor Brian Ray and Spence Witten. Um, before I introduce Professor Brian Gray, who will introduce Spence, I want to mention that I know both of them would like this to be um, a discussion. So at any point, if you would like to ask a question, please go ahead and chat any of your questions in the question and answer section or the chat box. I will be monitoring both of those um, and we will answer them in real time. So Professor Brian Ray. Um, he teaches in the Master of Legal Studies in Cybersecurity and Data Privacy and our JD program at Cleveland Marshall College of Law. He also co-founded and directs the Center for Cybersecurity and Privacy Protection at Cleveland Marshall College of Law. Brian, I'm going to toss it over to you to give a little bit more about your background and then if you will introduce Ben. Thanks, Julie, and welcome everyone. And uh, I want to echo Happy Veterans Day. Uh, thanks for taking the time to join us on this, what, what might be a holiday for many of you. Um, as Julie mentioned, I uh, am a professor here at Cleveland Marshall College of Law. Um, I co-founded and direct the, the Interdisciplinary Center on Cybersecurity and Privacy Protection, uh, which is based at the law school at Cleveland State University, but incorporates um, faculty uh, and students from across campus in a variety of programs. Um, and I also uh, co-founded and uh, teach within our Master of Legal Studies um, online cybersecurity and data privacy program. And uh, very excited to have Spence Witten with me here today. Um, Spence and I are gonna talk about, um, well, his career uh, a little bit in cybersecurity because um, he, like me, uh, came to cyber from a non-technical background, but unlike me, he's actually uh, mastered the technical side. Uh, uh, to a significant depth. Uh, and then we're going to use that experience, uh, both of our experiences, to talk to you about um, the exciting world of cybersecurity jobs, and in particular, cybersecurity jobs that, um, that, re that are related um, to law and regulations, which is really every cybersecurity job, as you'll see. But uh, in particular, um, a number of roles uh, really require uh, you to have a fairly in-depth understanding of the legal side, um, even if you're not a, a practicing lawyer, and there are plenty of jobs out there for practicing lawyers um, as well. So uh, let me start by introducing Spence. Um, Spence uh, has been a longtime friend of our program. He created the Cybersecurity One course for the online uh, program, and um, he has a really interesting uh, background. As I said before, he just did not have a technical degree uh, but he uh, got involved in a number of business roles and ultimately ended up in the cybersecurity field uh, working for uh, what was was then Lunarline and, and Lunarline has now been um, purchased and merged into Motorola. Um, but Lunarline um, is a cybersecurity company that provides both services and education and training uh, at a very high level, including um, to a number of uh, defense and national security agencies. Uh, and in that role, Spence has been involved in both uh, working uh, with clients to structure programs, to deliver services, deliver education, uh, as well as in designing um, Lunar Line's own online education program and training programs. And so um, really pleased to have him here and part of the program. And I'll let him sort of flesh out the bare bones that I just gave uh, and tell us a little bit about uh, himself and his background. So go ahead, Spence. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate the introduction and happy Veterans Day to everyone. And um, thank you for uh, 
for taking time out of uh, your holiday on this important occasion to join us for this wonderful conversation about cybersecurity career paths and understanding how law fits into that and how the NICE framework fits into that and how to think about your futures um, as cybersecurity professionals. And so, like Brian mentioned, you know, I came to cyber sort of randomly. Um, I was, uh, you know, I, I graduated college in um, 2005. And like, you know, a lot of folks, it was really hard to get started. And I sort of randomly ended up working for a venture capital consulting company. And so in 2008, you know, when the economic world fell apart, venture capital got hit pretty hard. And I was, uh, you know, out of a job, which was fine, because, you know, I didn't <laughs> really want to sit around and stay in venture capital, but I also didn't really see myself going into cybersecurity. It was an emerging issue. We knew it was important. I knew a little bit about it from um, the venture capital side, but it wasn't something like I was super excited about. It wasn't something I was really, you know, trying to direct myself to. And long story short, I wound up at a federal contractor working on cybersecurity stuff. And uh, I fell in love with it, and um, not just because it was sort of the one sector of the you know, global economy that was in a complete disaster, right? Federal cybersecurity was, was doing pretty well even in 2008, um, but just because it was an, a lot of fun. And the, one of the cool things about cybersecurity, there's also a, a challenge about cybersecurity careers, is that cybersecurity is a multidisciplinary challenge. And so every you um, folks from all different walks of life um, technical, non-technical, um, you know, really into computers, not into computers at all, can come together and make a difference in cybersecurity. And so this is really cool because it's sort of a flexible free-for-all and how you can direct and how you build skills, but also is a challenge both for individuals trying to chart a career path and for organizations trying to organize their cybersecurity skill sets and understand where um, the gaps are and how they build an organization that's ready to face modern cyber challenges. And so this is where the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, NICE, comes into play. Um, and we're going to be diving into NICE in a little bit more detail later on in the presentation. But one of the things I kind of want to show you is how the um, cybersecurity community is coalescing around a really disciplined way of thinking about cybersecurity skill sets. Um, and how you can position yourselves um, to grow as professionals along this path that we're all starting to um, you know, understand and coalesce around and how our program fits into that and how we help students prepare themselves for futures as cybersecurity pros. And back to you, Brian. Yeah, thanks, Spence. And um, you know that's a really important point that we'll touch on throughout the conversation today. Uh, and as Julie mentioned, if you have specific questions, just feel free to pop them in the chat and uh, we'll address them. Spence and I uh, can talk forever, uh, even though we talk a lot <laughs> to each other, because uh, this is just such an interesting topic. But uh, real quick, before we get into the NICE uh, framework, uh, which we'll spend some time in, just here we've got a, a representative sample um, and really should have um, the, the more recent CCPA on here or now CPRA, uh, which are the California laws. Uh, California came online with the first statewide comprehensive privacy, data privacy law and then decided it wasn't good enough. So the voters just uh, voted to change it uh, in the last election. So it's gonna get even more complicated. But uh, the point, larger point is, uh, the number of laws related to both data security uh, and data privacy, although increasingly data privacy uh, is the dominant realm, are, are growing and, and continue to grow. Uh, GDPR is kind of an umbrella framework for all of the European laws that are out there, uh, and all the European laws sort of tie back to that. Uh, but there's a range of other things going on in Europe, like just a news item yesterday. Uh, that uh, Europe placed restrictions on the sale of surveillance technologies, which is another interesting area uh, that I've got some expertise in. Uh, and so uh, one of the, the things that you, you begin to know, whether you come to cyber from a business perspective, uh, realizing it's a risk to the business that you've got to manage or that your, your product depends on meeting certain compliance standards, which is uh, increasingly the case, um, or if you're on the technical side and you're deep in the weeds of trying to construct the tools um, and the, and or use the tools uh, and construct the program, uh, or if you're on a compliance uh, or legal side where you're squarely in this, um, law kind of frames quite, law and regulations frame quite a bit of what you're doing because the, many of the risks 
Um, and there's always outright business risk, but many of the risks uh, that you're trying to manage around uh, and decide how to prioritize your resources because you're never going to have a perfect cybersecurity system. So you got to figure out how to prioritize them. Uh, and much of that prioritization is, is just simply driven by what are the legal risks? Uh, how sensitive is that data? Is it subject to certain specific compliance standards? Uh, frankly, what are the penalties uh, if I end up uh, having a breach with respect to that data? And or uh, if you're in an environment like health, you know, what are the potential regulatory uh, fines that might accrue if there's an investigation that shows I wasn't doing uh, these things that I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, and so um, that's, that's really the, the raison d'etre behind our program. Uh, we started out teaching um, these, teaching the, these, these um, legal frameworks to law students and decided, you know what, they can't really do their job properly as lawyers if they don't understand the technical side. Uh, and then had increasing interest um, from non-lawyers wanting to get the legal background. And so um, as we'll talk about today, almost any job, uh, you, you need to understand at least some dimension of this, and especially as you proceed through the ranks and get more senior and have a strategic position, it's just really important to have the ability, not that you're gonna know all of the regulations uh, in detail on their own, but once you have that general framework, then you're able to adapt and consume and understand uh, what it is uh, that new regulations require. So let's jump in then uh, to the NICE framework. And um, as Spence mentioned, uh, NICE is uh, a uh, national standards setting organization that flows from um, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, cybersecurity frameworks, which are sort of the gold standard frameworks that almost all of those laws and, and regulations and other frameworks map back to. Uh, and what NICE's mandate uh, to develop was, well, given the, the practical guidance that's coming out of NIST as to how to structure a uh, and grow and mature a cybersecurity program, what are the roles, the, what are the jobs, uh, and, and more importantly, what are the practical uh, skills uh, that you need um, to have a workforce or that you need in your workforce to be able to accomplish um, the objectives that the NIST frameworks provide. Um, and so we're gonna dive into, uh, we're gonna sort of go in, not wholesale, uh, but actually um, we'll put a link in the chat so you'll be able to go to the full uh, NICE framework and see what we're pulling from. But we're gonna start to jump into some of these, um, uh, some of these frameworks right now, or, or, or parts of the framework right now. And so starting here, and I'm gonna, Spence, now turn it back to you. Um, th this is the most, uh, so the way the NICE framework works is on the left side, oops, we lost it, um, Julie. I think you're cut, let's wait on it, there we go. Well, well, we'll throw that in the chat later, don't worry about it now. Um, so the way the NICE framework's laid out is you've got category, specialty area, work role, and work role definition, um, which is you know nice. Some, it, in some ways it's a little bit too elaborate, but it's a really nice detailed, breakdown of here, here are the kinds of things that you need to have, the skill sets you would need to have uh, to do these, these roles and the kinds of roles that you want in your workforce, right? And so the category legal advice and advocacy, um, that's an obvious one where um, it's legal focused, right? Uh, not just lawyers, but compliance as well, uh, which is that second box on specialty area. Um, and you know, these are the people that are really going to be doing the legal analysis. And again, importantly, uh, within most organizations, it's not just the lawyers that are doing this. There are a set of professionals um, at the top. It's often the chief privacy officer if they have one. Uh, and the chief privacy officer sometimes is a lawyer, but doesn't have to be a lawyer. Uh, and then the folks below uh, that person within the organization um, are deeply involved, usually not, uh, although sometimes they'll be dedicated to privacy. Uh, but often doing compliance um, with respect to a range of uh, regulations. Um, and so that, that's, you know, that's one obvious area and a real growth area uh, where we're seeing uh, lots and lots of new openings, new demand, uh, again, because of that explosion of um, laws uh, that are just continuing uh, to grow. Uh, and then, of course, the second box, uh, training, education, awareness, if you're going to do training, uh, sometimes you'll be training more um, on the on the technical side, but even there, the technical side needs to map to these laws because the controls you're putting in place are controls that are often either specifically dictated or 
used uh, to meet the compliance requirements. So let's flip to the next uh, slide and then I'm gonna uh, uh, hand it over to Spence. So Spence, you wanna talk a little bit about risk management generally and how that, um, that specialty area really connects uh, these different dimensions of cyber? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also, I just want to I want to step up to just a quick higher level for folks that may not have been able to dive into the Nice framework or might not be familiar with the Nice framework. So, like like Brian said, um, the Nice framework, the the work roles and the special areas that we're looking at right here, is an awesome organizational tool for thinking about cybersecurity skill sets and careers. If there's one knock against the Nice framework, it is that it is extremely complicated, um, and it is it's a little dense. And it takes a while of looking at it to really understand how all the pieces come together. But I still encourage you to take that time. I mean, I think if you, you know, spend an hour with the NICE framework, reading through it, it'll eventually start to make sense. And why it's so important is that, like I had mentioned before, because cybersecurity is such a multidisciplinary challenge and because so many people kind of like myself are self-taught, it's sort of been a free-for-all wild west on the career side. And so the NICE framework is an effort to bring some um, you know, direction and discipline to this so that on the individual side, you can look at potential career paths and skill sets and areas you can focus on and, and build capabilities in. And then if you're managing, you can think about what skill sets your organization needs to, to function um, in a modern cyber world. So it is, it is, very, it is complicated. Um, it is a little dense but I do encourage everyone to take some time and read through it because it is a wonderful way to break down um, some of the mystique that comes from a free-for-all Wild West discipline and uh, bring some focus to it and so that we can start understanding on an individual level how we, we fit into the world. And so with the risk management perspective, so risk management is really Spence, interesting. Spence, can I just elaborate yeah. on that a bit? And the other nice of thing course. about it is once you start to learn the language and understand it, and first of all, it gives you a framework for trying to understand the the, the world that you're either thinking about advancing and or entering. Uh, but also, as you describe yourself in your resume, right, you want to kind of um, map to this these languages and identify the skill sets uh, that you've got. It gives you a nice common language, uh, as it were, to communicate to employers, hey, here's what I can do. And, and just simply knowing it uh, really, you know, demonstrates that you that you know you know your stuff and that you're you're interested engaged in the field perfect thank you brian and so when we're looking at the risk management here area here with the two work roles that we have up on the screen so we have authorizing official and designating representative um this is uh this is very federal terminology uh federal dod terminology but you know most it, it's widely it's widely applicable to other organizations too most organizations have a the buck stops here type of responsibility for system security, where there is ultimately someone that needs to say that this aspect of our IT environment is secure and I take ownership over that. And that's, who, that's what the authorizing official or designating representative does. That's their role in the organization is to plant a flag and say, hey, I've looked at this component of our IT infrastructure, you know, this system, this thing, this process, and I have declared that it is, you know, to the best of my ability that it's as secure as we can, we can make it usually based on some standard um, for evaluation. And so um, this is a, a skill set that we really, in our program here at Cleveland State, you know, we really prepare folks to assume that we, we prepare people for lots of different paths, but this is a very um, clear uh, kind of career objective path that our program prepares folks for, because it is, again, at the core of that multidisciplinary aspect. So as an authorizing official, you may not have to be a lawyer, but you really have to understand all the key regulatory requirements that impact your system and the day-to-day -day operations of the people who use that system. And you, you cannot escape that. And that's not even just federal, right? That's outside of federal. If you're working in finance, you're working in healthcare, or even if you're working for a small mom and pop shop somewhere, um, it's, the same, it's the same deal. You have to understand the regulatory environment you operate in and then on the flip side, you also have to, even if you're not necessarily like, you know, genius level technical looking at code, like, you know, coming up with new exploits, you know, the really fringe super technical areas of cybersecurity, you have to have a technical familiarity enough to understand your IT 
operations, understand how to do basic assessments of those IT operations, and what to do about those findings. You got to bring those two together to be able to make the kind of informed decisions about risk and say, you know, the risk of operating this system is low enough that my organization can do so without you know, risking, um, uh, you know, serious impact from cyber attack activity. And then the other um, uh, career path that's under there, security control assessor. And so this is usually a third party, though some organizations have them internally, where, um, you know, someone's looking at the flip side of that, right? They're evaluating a system both for compliance with various regulations. So that could be federal regulations like, you know, those promulgated by NIST, or they could be, you know, private sector um, regulatory requirements like PCI. It doesn't really matter. Um, you know, they're looking from an external perspective, uh, usually, again, as an independent third party, usually, um, to say whether or not that system is in compliance with those requirements and is of, um, you know, has implemented controls in a way that really genuinely improves system security posture. And so it's the same challenge, right? You have to understand the regulatory requirements and the legal requirements. You don't have to be a lawyer. In fact, most aren't, but you do have to have a deep grounding in regulatory compliance. And you have to understand enough on the technical side to conduct those kind of technical reviews to assess whether or not a system is actually secure. And so this, I think it, we keep coming back to the, we keep hammering away on this point, but it's a key element of how we approach tr um, you know, educating future cyber professionals is bringing together that legal and regulatory side with enough technical expertise that A, you, know, you, can, you, you can understand what you're seeing from a technical perspective when you go out and you run scans and you look at vulnerabilities and you look at network architecture diagrams, and B, you have enough of a framework that you can build those technical skills in the future because the technical world constantly changes. And so we, we help, and you know, a lot, most of our students coming in have absolutely no technical background, and we give them that framework and that initial basic confidence that you know, they can go out in the field, understand what they're seeing, and then build those skills throughout their career. Yeah, and, and just to elaborate a bit, I mean, one of the key sort of soft but, but critical skill sets that very few programs teach you is how to speak each other's language. And so um, uh, we get uh, folks from all different backgrounds within the program and our faculty, as, as Spence and I are illustrating, is drawn from both uh, the legal and the technical side. And we, we put you together and, and make you uh, sort of work on, on those different dimensions, which is, which is absolutely critical. So one course that I teach uh, with JD students is we get the JD students together uh, with MSIS students on the technical side, and we do uh, NIST-based um, security assessments, which is essentially what a security control assessor uh, would do for nonprofits. And it's really always amazing to me to watch the law students who have only have gotten the basic technical grounding from Cyber One. Uh, Cybersecurity One, which is the same course we teach in the online program, um, and the MSI students, which often have no legal background at all, but sort of you know really have strong technical chops, and to watch uh, how they you know sort of explain to each other and learn from each other how to apply the NIST framework, which is a general framework, but requires you to try to figure these things out, um, and you know that that just underscores how important it is to to get an understanding of sort of both worlds, uh, as well as the business and strategic side. Uh, because in the real in the real world, to do your job well, you can't just stay in your silo and say, "Well, well, legal will manage that, or technical will manage that," because otherwise, you don't have an effective program. Um, and and yeah, yeah Brian, if I may, because I think that's a great point to to, to emphasize too. So, um, and it's a it's just for whom whomever is on the uh, you know all all the audience here, you know, let's say you come from a you know super technical background. The world, as Brian mentioned, you know, as the laws both increase in complexity as well as quantity domestically and internationally, even if like you're a you know a great penetration tester and that's your focus, like you can't ignore the regulatory environment anymore. You have to have a grounding in that to be successful as a professional. And so, you know, sometimes with our pen testing teams, we're dragging them kicking and screaming into learning that stuff because they really want to stay, you know, uh, you know, fingers on keyboards. But, you know, you can't, you can't ignore that stuff. And on the flip side, you can't just be a 
lawyer or a regulatory compliance expert um, or a business expert and not have a degree of technical familiarity. Again, you don't need to be a technical genius. You don't need to be, you know, dreaming up new exploits in your spare time, but you got to be familiar with this stuff because we're having that convergence. The regulatory compliance side is getting ever more technical and the technical side is getting ever more focused on regulatory compliance and it's coming together and it impacts every role across an organization. Uh, Julie, let's go on to the next slide then. And um, here again, moving across. Um, actually, Julie, I think we skipped one. Oh no, you're you know you're you're in the wait. Did we we didn't get to cybersecurity man? There we go. All right. So um, in many respects, this oversee and govern um, you know outside of those sort of legal and legal direct legal roles. Uh, are the kind of roles that we're we're trying to prepare people to have the full suite of um, core skills that they can then build on throughout their career uh, to reach this level. Um, and so, um, and again, because when you're at the oversee and govern uh, level, you're you know, you're at the sort of strategic pinnacle or or just below it, uh, where you're taking responsibility uh, for uh, the program and often um, you know core aspects of the organization that you're working in. And you really, you really have to be able to talk to everybody, right? And you have to be able to understand uh, what what the experts below you, who's you know, who are sitting in one substantive area or another, are telling you, and then make judgments about uh, you know whether you know whether you need to probe for more, uh, you know whether you can trust what they're telling you, um, and and then report sometimes report up, or if you're at the very top, uh, make the call, right? And so um, you know these roles. Uh, you definitely have to have a really strong grasp of the regulatory environment you're working in, because that's, you know, again, dictates um, much of the risk. Uh, and I'll turn over to Spence to talk a little bit more about some of these roles. And again, so this is a um, another area that it's it's very federalized language, but it is generalizable to the um, rest of. Uh, it's the organizations, particularly complicated organizations. So, you know, information system security manager. So we talk about authorizing official as an ultimate person who has to sign off on, um, on a system security posture. You know, this, it, with an information system security manager, you're, you know, oftentimes, sometimes in that, that authorizing official role, but not necessarily, you know, it's a very day-to-day -day operational um, operations focus. And so, you know, for those of you in the audience that are familiar with cybersecurity, you know that a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff really isn't that super exciting. It's operational stuff. It's, you know, executing a patch management process. It's running a, you know, configuration management process. Somebody wants to make this change to the system. How do we figure out whether or not that's, uh, you know, a secure change? It's, you know, making sure that vulnerability scanning is happening on schedule. It's coordinating the penetration testing teams. Um, and again, it is another, you know, it, it tends to be a little bit more in the weeds um, operationally than, you know, some of the other roles we've talked about. But at the same time, it's it's bringing together those diverse skill sets. So, you know, you in an ISSM role, you have to have, you know, those basic people skills that kind of come with the, you know, you know, traditional business type background. You got to understand the technical aspects. You got to realize the regulatory compliance environment. And one of the cool parts about the ISSM job, you have to be able to see in the future for where the organization is evolving so that you can help that system or that component or whatever you're resp responsible for grow in a way that supports overall system objectives. So maybe let's say you're an ISSM for a call center supporting the internal revenue service. And you know that you need to grow to, you know, this, this call center is gonna to grow to support another 50,000 daily calls. And all this stuff is gonna to happen to make that possible. And so it's not necessarily your responsibility to build that IT infrastructure, but you have to be able to see around corners and look down the road to understand what the security impacts are gonna be. So you can advise all the different stakeholders in that process, how to, um, you know, meet those objectives, but do so securely. It's a really neat role to play. It's a role that's increasing in importance as we get more involved with, you know, building cool systems and moving stuff to the cloud. And as uh, some of the more uh, really neat modern um, IT tools make their way into big organizations, it's a fun role. But again, another one of those multidisciplinary roles. 
Um, so uh, ComSec Manager is very, very specific to Fed. So I think we can we can gloss over that. I mean, it's a, it's a very specific role for very specific types of organizations. But Cyber Workforce Developer and Manager, I think it is exactly what it says it is. And so if you're in that role, you're understanding things like the NICE framework. You're understanding the future skill sets that are required. You're, you know, understanding what is going to be required from a skill set side, you know, one year, two year, five years down the road, and you're helping your organization build those. So, you know, find the right people, maybe develop internal training or go buy external training to help people develop their skill set um, and understanding how skills and people are evolving to face these threats. And it's a, it's a really exciting role because the field is changing so much and because training is becoming so um, much more disciplined thanks to organizations like NISP and the, and the um, NICE initiative um, helping us develop frameworks for um, building people and building human resources. But um, it's, a, again, an, another job that, you know, where you have to bring together those technical and regulatory compliance sides and we focus on helping. In fact, we have some students um, in our program now who are, ex you know, explicitly focused on doing this because they come from an education background. Um, and again, like, like I said, when I, um, you know, at the very beginning, you can come to cyber from any type of background. Um, and, uh, you know, we have, you know, superintendents of schools, we have principals, we've had teachers who are learning the skill set, the cyber skill set side and the technical side so they can play this role um, because it's increasingly important for, for organizations. Um, moving down to cyber policy and strategy. So um, this can be high level, like a lot of people think when we use the word policy. So advising um, lawmakers and governments on uh, high level policy, but it also goes deep into an organization. So policy and security can have a very granular um, uh, message. And so it used to be that you could play this role without some technical familiarity. And the world has just gotten so complicated that you really do need to have that technical background, not background, but technical um, comfort level to play a meaningful role in policy. And I, again, I don't, I don't say that to scare people off because I, I'm, I'm confident no matter what background you come from, we can give you the base technical knowledge you need to play a role in policy and it becomes a personal differentiator. And so another message that I hope everybody in the audience comes away from is that, you know, A, you don't have to be intimidated by the technical side. It, it really, anybody can learn the basics enough to make a meaningful difference. And doing so, B, doing so will be a major differentiator for you on an individual basis. So, you know, if you're coming in from a policy perspective and policy and law is something you really, really love and you want to play a role in that process, but you also can speak the technical language, you can spot talk to the super technical folks, you can, you know, you've done some hands-on technical work yourselves, whether it's just in our program or even for other organizations, you bring so much to the policy process. Um, and you're, you're all of a sudden, you know, you've gone from, you know, someone who can just help out with policy to someone who's instrumental and critical to that process because you understand both sides. You get policy and regulation and you understand the technical landscape too. And you're just invaluable to whomever it is that you happen to be supporting. And then obviously executive cyber leadership, this is stuff like chief information security officer or chief information officer or even, you know, CEO. Some organizations are so you know, impacted by cybersecurity environment that, um, you know, even the CEO can't, you can't escape it. You can't delegate it. It's just too important. Um, and, uh, um, you know, we, we help prepare folks at that level because you still need that grounding in the regulatory compliance side along with that technical grounding too. Okay. And so we'll, we'll move relatively quickly through the next um, two slides. Uh, so just to just to again illustrate the sort of breadth uh, of areas where this mixed skill set's important, uh, investigations uh, you're going to be working intensively with legal uh, requirements. Um, you know, if you're doing crime investigation, obviously you need to understand uh, um, how to speak the language of the lawyers and the law enforcement uh, folks, and then forensics uh, analyst. Um, you, you know, you're you're the one going in trying to figure out well what happened, uh, and and sort of you know go through and unravel the chain um, from the incident backwards, uh, as well as the defense forensic analyst. And and these are uh, really critical roles um, that'll work directly uh, with law firms or in-house counsel, um, because uh, ultimately 
what you're worried about once you've had a breach is either regulatory investigation uh, and or litigation. And so you need to document for yourself, both to do remediation, but also to manage the, the, the downside risk, figure out what regulatory obligations might have been triggered. Is it, is it a reportable breach? Uh, you know, do I need to report to relevant regulatory body? And so the technical side is going through trying to figure out well what actually happened. But on top of that, okay, and does it qualify to meet the standard that these laws have laid out for certain either legal obligations uh, or potential legal risks to manifest? And then ultimately, if there is uh, anticipated regulatory investigation, um, you got to you got to work with the lawyers. And and in particular, really big area here that that many technical firms in particular um, don't pay sufficient attention to is uh, the role that, the potential role that attorney client privilege and work product play because a really interesting developing case law that I've done a lot of work on uh, around what are the best practices to allow access uh, to the raw information that either, um, well, that in particular a plaintiff side would need to figure out uh, and make their own case uh, while still allowing for candid and protected conversations on uh, the legal risks uh, that are manifesting. And really the best practices are that you do a two-track uh, analysis. So one team is doing a sort of just the facts. Uh, here's the technical reality uh, that we're uncovering. Uh, and another team is doing that while talking to the lawyers about um, you know, whether uh, certain legal obligations um, have, have been incurred. And so uh, uh, those, those groups really work hand in glove. The lawyers who are incident response need to be able to talk to the technical people in real time. And the technical people need to be able to talk to the lawyers, the lawyers in real time and make really important critical calls that can be incredibly costly if you go the wrong way uh, uh, under intense pressure. And so, you know, you can't, you can't just wait and sort of hope that you can figure it out. You gotta be able to talk to each other. Uh, Spence, I don't know if you wanna add anything here. No, you nailed it. All right, perfect. Let's go to the next one. Uh, and then here we've just got uh, some of the more, um, deep technical roles that aren't necessarily sitting at a real strategic level. Uh, but even these, as you work, look at uh, examples of them, understanding the legal environment so that your analysis can feed up to those people in their strategic roles and really be more value to them. Um, if, you've, if you yourself can offer up independently, hey, you know, you, we might wanna think about X. Uh, with respect to the legal side, uh, and and Spence, I'll, I'll turn it to you here because you've got you've got a deeper understanding of these roles than I do. Yeah, and so this is a, another great example of how um, lots of different folks can play a role in cybersecurity. And so, you know, again, the, the audience here is extremely diverse. Um, you you all come from uh, various different backgrounds, and I hope throughout this presentation, you're starting to see you know, where you fit and also understand that, yes, you, you do fit. So if you're, if you're from a cyber background, you already obviously see that you fit, but you know, if you don't have that skill set, I want to, I want you to know that, you know, there is a home for you in this discipline. There's lots of different ways for you to play. And so that's really well reflected on this screen. So um, like w warnings analyst, again, we're, we're very, um, uh, uh, very, very DOD focused term, um, but it's uh, um, still it, what it, it's understanding um, uh, you know, what the indicators are you're seeing and being able to prepare your organization to face those. And so it is not an overly technical role. Um, it has technical elements, but a lot of it is you know, reading intelligence reports, a lot of which you know, you'd think only comes from say the National Security Agency, but there's a whole ton of really, really great private sector um, intel reports. And if you work in a large organization, it's likely that you're you know, company or organization subscribes to a lot of those. And so you'd be sifting through that and trying to figure out, you know, what's real, what's not, and what to do about it. Um, and again, um, not, not super, super technical. It's something that, uh, you know, you, a lot of different folks from lots of different backgrounds can play a role in. Uh, exploitation analyst is, um, is however, uh, tends to be extremely um, uh, um, technical and often in time has an off, explicitly offensive focus. So this is something done, mainly by the government. Um, and it is, it, is, it is very technical. I mean, you're piecing together, you're understanding adversarial networks, you're um, understanding the vulnerabilities on those networks, and you're putting together packages and exploits to go after them. So it's a very offensive role, very DOD and intelligence community. Uh, but then down into all source analysts, all source analysts, um, you know, you spend most of your day reading news. So if you're a news junkie, this is a great role for you. 
um, you're going to spend a lot of time looking at um, uh, some uh, overt news, you know, open source news, and some maybe poking around on the um, dark web to see what criminal who, what criminal organizations are up, which ones are down, uh, who's doing what, when, where, why, and how, and understanding all that and briefing um, information security teams on your findings so they can do something about it. Again, not a very technical position. I mean, most of our, you know, my company does do cyber intelligence work, and most of our um, cyber intel folks, they have to get familiar with tools and they got to learn how to run them. Um, but they're bringing a very, you know, sort of liberal arts mindset to the challenge of sifting through all that data. It's a, it's a lot of fun and it's a great way for um, individuals that don't necessarily have a technical background to break into a cybersecurity field by becoming that type of all source intel analyst. Um, and then mission assessment uh, specialist, again, very, very DOD and um, uh, language and even fed civil. Uh, um, language, but again, it is really about understanding um, and developing uh, either strategies, plans, uh, executable approaches for achieving specific objectives. Um, and uh, a very, a very broad, um, uh, very broad work role. But again, highlighting that fact that lots of different skill sets are needed to tackle the cyber challenge. All right. Uh, thanks, Vince. And Julie, you know, let's skip that next slide, which just, you know, goes into some more detail, but just in the interest of time, um, let's go on then uh, to the program details and then we'll, we'll feel free to post questions in the chat and we'll address them then, but we'll leave a little bit of time uh, for question here at the end. Um, and so Julie, you want to, you want to give them a quick overview of our program? Absolutely. Well, first I want to thank both you, Brian and Spence for that really informative presentation. Um, so if Brian and Spence at all, which they did to me, uh, motivate you to start this program or to look more into this program, um, both of them are professors in this program. So as you can see, they're both very knowledgeable and passionate about this. So just think about what your classes would look like. So just briefly, um, our program, our Master of Legal Studies in Cybersecurity and Data Privacy, is part-time or can be full-time, it's very flexible, and it's fully online. Um, we enroll in every single term, so the fall, the spring, and the summer. Our next upcoming term starts January 11th, and we are still accepting, accepting applications for that cohort. It's a total of 30 credits, which are 10 courses, um, and you take them consecutively. So every single semester, you will take some some courses. Um, and again, we can be flexible with that. And I encourage you to reach out to me if you um, want to learn more about how we can tailor this program to fit your schedule. We are able to do that. We have some students who take one course. We have some who take two or three courses, um, even four a semester. Um, and so again, I encourage you to reach out to me and we can talk about what your individual curriculum will look like. Um, so here is the curriculum. Here's a snapshot of the 10 courses that we offer. Um, Spence teaches in Cybersecurity 1. Um, Brian teaches an introduction to American law. So I want to toss it back to Brian. We won't go through every single course in detail, but I'd like both of them just to speak a little bit about the two courses that they teach. Um, so Brian, I'll, I'll toss it back to you quickly to talk about your courses. Sure. And um, just to to emphasize here, uh, Introduction to American Law, uh, Legal Writing, Cybersecurity 1 and Cybersecurity 2, along with Privacy Law and Management that you'll see in, in uh, semester four. Really, these are the, the core that give you that thorough grounding um, in both the legal uh, and the technical sides of things. And so the first two semesters will really get you that, that nice foundation. Uh, and then we move you through um, some upper level, more law compliance focused uh, courses to, to deepen that in semester three. And then, and then privacy law and management is really from an operational perspective, uh, integrating um, the, um, the, the compliance um, along many different dimensions from the perspective of a multinational. Um, introduction to American law, uh, we completely recreated this course for this program. Uh, so that it's cybersecurity and data privacy focused um, gives you the the grounding in being able to read cases, uh, read regulatory materials, um, understand the core uh, components of uh, focus on the American legal system, but also looking a little bit internationally. Uh, a sort of um, a, a sort of a um, 
a version of what you get in your first year of law school, but compressed into a semester and focused on sort of getting in the core skill set so we can quickly advance you through it. Uh, and then cybersecurity one, I'll let Spence talk a little bit about that. Um, and then we'll we'll move on to the next line. And actually, I would like to uh, take a brief pause to answer a question oh, yeah, that sure. has come in from Christy Markwell. So uh, her question is, if uh, you are an attorney looking to get into cybersecurity, but have no technical knowledge and can't, can't commit to an LLM program right now, what would be a good cert to gain a deeper technical understanding? That is a wonderful question. So cybersecurity remains a very certification um, heavy field. And so that is changing as degree programs come online. So five years ago, there were no cybersecurity degree, or very few at least. And, and now, uh, you know, we've, we, you know, trailblazers like Cleveland State have developed, you know, great programs. Um, and so there is, uh, but even with those degrees, it's still a very certification heavy state there are, uh, or discipline rather. And so to answer Christy's question, a, a good beginner cert um, that actually does qualify you for some federal jobs um, that require certification is a program is a cert called security plus um, security plus is not an overtly technical cert though it does test basic knowledge on uh, particularly on networking focused security issues which is you know really important to understand how network networks focus um, and security plus is a cert that anybody you know, you could be an English major, you could, you know, maybe dropped out of high school, it doesn't matter. Like, I'm confident that anybody can sit down with a Security Plus study guide and maybe some online courses, which are really inexpensive and knock out Security Plus. Um, there's lots of stuff you have to learn. So, I mean, even some technical folks struggle with it just because it's stuff that, you know, they've forgotten, um, you know, basic facts and figures about, you know, networking in particular. Um, but this is, this is a cert that anybody can, can tackle. Um, another and, cert on the technique. Oh, I'm sorry, actually, ahead, sorry not to interrupt, but uh, and Christy, reach out to us because the other thing that we offer um, as a, as a, as a sort of um, lighter version of the full MLS is a certificate um, that incorporates cybersecurity one, cybersecurity two, privacy law and management, and some others. Um, and we can, anyways, we'd be happy to talk to you about that and work with you on uh, seeing if a, if, a, if a smaller version of this in a certificate makes sense for you. Because the nice thing about cybersecurity one and cybersecurity two is that we're, they're designed to give that technical background to people with no technical uh, experience as well, so that we do get folks with technical experience who are looking either for a refresher or to, you know, to get that that angle uh, with a legal perspective. So sorry, Spence, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I wanted to just mention that. Yeah, that's wonderful. No, thank you, Brian. And so um, another, the other good one that I'd recommend if you're feeling especially ambitious um, is Certified Ethical Hacker. So um, we have, um, I can, a great example was a technical writer in my company. Um, we put him through a, he, he really just wanted to dive into um, um, uh, the more technical side, and we put him through a one-week boot camp for CEH and pass with flying colors. So um, I think that CEH is a little harder if you haven't been hands-on, like if you haven't run NMAP to, you know, enumerate a network, or you haven't run and looked at a vulnerability scanner. I mean, there's a lot of tools that they kind of expect you to at least be familiar with, but um, you know, that doesn't have to stand in your way. And a lot of those tools are open source where you can play with them on their own. So if you're feeling especially ambitious, CEH is worth um, going towards just, I would say it would probably take you about a year of relaxed study and playing with tools to get to the point where you felt comfortable taking that. Whereas security plus would be a matter of weeks um, with this, with the boot camp. So security plus is a good one to start with. Um, CEH certified ethical hacker, if you're feeling especially ambitious are two good, you know, beginner to intermediate technical certs that would build your skill set in that area. Yeah, and one of the things that we're working on is uh, uh, most of our courses already map to some of these external certifications. Um, the International Association of Privacy Professionals has certifications that are more on the compliance privacy side and privacy law and management is built around that. Uh, but the Certified Echo Hacker, Hacker certification, uh, Spence and I have been talking about, he's eager to create a course that would essentially provide you the background for that. Uh, and, and it's really a question of whether we can directly connect it uh, with the group that provides the certification. Um, but anyways, uh, that's something that we're, that we're hoping to fold into this program uh, in the near future. And another thing that I'd like to emphasize for everybody is that, you know, even absent, I mean, if you don't want to bite off a full cert right now, 
Um, most of the tools, you got to be very careful. There are real strict legal requirements about, you know, what you can and cannot do with cybersecurity tools. But um, there's a, a distribution of Linux called Kali Linux. It's free. Um, I'm confident that anybody that, you know, can poke around on YouTube and instructional, uh, you know, other instructional videos on, on Google could figure out how to download and install and get working. And it has a full set of cybersecurity tools that you can start playing with. Again, I really don't advise you to like, you know, point a scanner at the FBI and see what happens because that's not going to go well for anybody. So you have to be very careful in how you use these tools, but you really can start playing on your own. And um, I want to, I want the industry to move away from being self-taught because folks that are self-taught end up with lots of gaps in their knowledge, but it is still a great way to start. Um, it's not, I, there's no financial commitment. Um, you can play on your own time. I mean, if you only got a couple of hours a week or, you know, you can, to, to poke at stuff, you can learn the basics. Um, and so I do encourage people to do that too. I mean, the tools and the resources are out there to start learning how um, tools work. And that's at least how I learn. And that's the philosophy I bring to the program, right? So to bring it back to the answering the question for um, cybersecurity one, you know, particularly for um, adult education, I mean, this is a program focused on folks that have a little bit of professional experience. Um, I, I don't learn now. I mean, ever since I got an undergrad, like I have to be hands-on to learn. I mean, I have to like, you know, get my hands on, try something, not have it work, not have it work, then finally have it work, and then go back and kind of understand the principles. And so that's how I approach Cybersecurity One. It is a lab-based course. I don't know of any intro um, to cybersecurity courses uh, that are designed for people with absolutely no cybersecurity knowledge that are lab-based. I have you download Kali Linux. I have permission from, you know, CSU to run basic scans against CSU assets. Um, so you can get hands on there. Um, you will get extremely, extremely frustrated because I'll have a hard time getting it to work. And I'm going to hold your hand until we figure out it, figure it out together. And you're going to get going in the right direction and you're going to get hands on with these tools. And then on top of that, we layer on top of that, that theoretical education. So, you know, there's the textbook, there's readings, um, there are exercises like you have it in a traditional class, but the vast majority of your grade, you know, over 50% is based on um, on the labs. And that, that the whole purpose of that is to get folks that aren't technical, like, you know, Christy and from her question, um, get your hands on with cybersecurity tools um, so that you're no longer intimidated by the technical aspect and you understand how to go build your skills on your own when you leave that class. And so it, it's, it's really fun. I think um, all my students hate me for the first month as they're starting to get up to speed. Um, cause it is a lot for folks that have never done this before. It's kind of intimidating. Um, there's a lot going on, but, um, you know, you get a whole ton of attention from me as we learn, um, these labs and we get through them together. I mean, that's my, I, I will hold your hand and we'll do them together if we have to, um, because yeah, I just want you to get through it and build that comfort level. And then by, you know, the second month of the program, students are having a blast, um, learning how to replicate websites and steal credentials, learning how to scan, um, uh, networks for vulnerabilities, understanding what those scan results look like, understand, learning how to break into encrypted documents. I mean, we're having a lot of fun and learning in the same, uh, in the same um, breath. And so that's the, that's the philosophy for cybersecurity one. And then you can take that technical grounding into semester two where Brian takes back over. Yeah. And so then in cybersecurity two, you basically go back through those same topics, but in the context of working as uh, with your colleagues uh, in teams to uh, develop a HIPAA compliant. HIPAA is um, the, the healthcare uh, regulation, which is one of the most uh, extensive within the U.S. Uh, in, in semester three, you go into deep deep dive into it. Uh, but in cybersecurity too, do you develop the technical security plan set of security controls? It's really an application that builds directly on it. Uh, and then in legal writing, you're going deeper into learning to consume, uh, use, and to some extent produce uh, legal materials. Uh, and so um, uh, happy to answer any questions about uh, the other uh, courses in the program. Note that uh, some of the ones in semester four and semester five, these are examples of um, many of the courses that we offer, uh, we're, we're bringing them online sort of uh, one course at a time. And so in the initial iteration, they might be different, uh, but uh, eventually we're hopeful to have a range of uh, potential options in semester four and five, and actually to some extent in semester three as well. Um, we actually do have ahead. a question. We have a, yep. a question from Preston. It's a question near and dear to my heart. So Preston is in high school and uh, wants to know what um, you know he can do to get uh, um, 
you know, to build his skill sets uh, before he graduates. And he has downloaded Cali Linux and has been playing around with it. And Preston, please, please continue. No, so it is, it is a good idea. The issue is, <laughs> yeah, the issue is be very, very careful. I mean, treat it like a loaded weapon. So there are, uh, and it also depends on what state you're in. So um, there, the patchwork for uh, of laws governing how and what you can do with cybersecurity tools are really complicated. I mean, lawyers truthfully don't even really understand them because they're a wild west, right? I mean, it's one of those areas where 10 different lawyers have 10 different opinions about what is and what is not allowed. And uh, if you get in front of the wrong judge, uh, things can go really badly. So you just yeah. gotta be really careful about what you're scanning. Um, and I would encourage you, so if you if you have the technical chops to download Kali Linux and run it in a VM, I mean, that's not necessarily easy stuff, then you could probably um, get online and learn how to build your own lab environment on your computer. And so you could build a home lab environment for free. I mean, you can download their various applications like uh, BWAP, so um, you know, buggy web application. Um, you can run on a virtual server on your computer that you can bang on all you want. You can hack into that all day long. There are other examples out there. And so the safest way to experiment is to do that. So I would go and learn how to build your own little cyber lab and start practicing. And then, um, you know, look for internship or even work opportunities. You know, just because you're in high school doesn't mean, you know, you can't start looking for employment opportunities to build that skill set. Um, a lot of, I, I would also point you in the direction of certifications, but Spend one of the challenges there is they require, what's that? Sorry, we got one more question and we're running a little low on time. So let me, let me, let oh, me okay. invite, um, Preston, feel free to reach out to us and, and we can we can give you a little more information over email. Uh, Spence, Spence obviously is, is, you know, he's got a lot of uh, great information to share on this um, and he does a great job working with our students to make sure we're staying within the bounds of the law. And by the way, uh, it's thanks to him that Ohio's revised criminal code allows for this kind of activity because we almost went down a path uh, that might have made it potentially illegal. But uh, Robert Thomas is asking if you've got your JD do you have to repeat intro to American law and legal research and writing? Uh, the short answer is not necessarily, and we're happy to work with you. We have a number of lawyers in the program. Um, interestingly, the ones that so far have gone through have, have wanted to do those to, uh, to get the background, but we're always happy to work with you. And if you've got the JD, uh, absolutely, we can certainly uh, easily waive uh, legal writing and intro to American law, likely. Uh, but let's have a conversation about it and we'll, we'll talk to you. And then what you would do uh, is later in the program, as I mentioned, we're, we're bringing new courses online uh, each semester. Um, you, you'd select from an additional set of related um, topics if you want to do the MLS because we, the, our, our accreditor requires us to have 30 credits to issue the degree. Excellent. So um, any other questions? Then I'll turn it back to Julie to close us out. Great, thank you, Brian, and thank you, Spence, again. And Robert, I'll answer your question quickly. Um, it says, how long is the program? And so it's a total of 30 credits, it's 10 courses. Um, if you do this on a part-time basis, which is two courses per semester, it'll take about five semesters. However, we are very flexible. Some students take three to four courses per semester, some take one. So it really depends on what you are able to take on. Um, so you and I can speak privately to talk about what your individual curriculum might look like. But quickly and, and before- Sorry, yes, sorry right. Julian, just to, it's okay. the other thing is, Robert, reach out to us because as I mentioned, uh, response to the other question, we also have a certificate version, which is fewer credits um, that, you know, if you're not, in, if you don't, not interested in the MLS, uh, but you want to get the, the core courses, um, it's, it, it, we, again, contact us and we'll give you more information about that. Great. So what I just want to highlight here quickly is that our next cohort is starting on January 11th, the spring cohort. We are still accepting applications. The deadline is December 14th. To apply to this program, you will apply online. Um, everything is listed here on this slide for what you need to apply online. But I strongly encourage you to reach out to me um, so we can talk about your background, make sure that this program is a good fit for you. And I, of course, can step you through the application process. Here is my contact information. I also chatted Brian Ray and Spence's contact um, information in the chat. They really would love for you to reach out to them. As you can see, they, will, they love to talk about this topic and are passionate about it. Um, so if there aren't any other questions and it's almost 1 p.m., I wanna say thank you 
everyone for attending. I know I speak on behalf of Brian and Spence when I say we really appreciate your time, especially on Veterans Day, and encourage you to reach out to us with any questions about the program or um, cybersecurity careers in general. Brian and Spence, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, just thanks for joining us and definitely reach out uh, if you've got more questions uh, that we can answer offline. And thank you, Spence. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Happy Veterans Day. Thank you and have a great day and we hope to hear from all of you soon. Bye-bye.